Would you agree that right now the world could really use some good news? Would you agree that our country could really use some good news? Would you also agree that our state, city, and our church might benefit from some good news right now? And what about you? I wonder if you could really use some good news right now. What would that good news be? I ask you this question today because Trinity Sunday, which always follows on the heels of Pentecost, is when we hear what is called the Great Commission. Jesus is challenged to his disciples to go forth to preach the good news and make disciples of all nations. They eventually did this, by the way. Kind of a silly thing to say. We, we are here after all. Of course they did. But how were they so successful? How did they change the world? It may have been because there was a method to their madness. It wasn't the message alone that changed the world. It was also the method that was used to spread that good news. And this is often overlooked. It was good news combined with good action that transformed the world. So let us start with the message. First of all, let's be clear here. We are not entirely sure what exactly these early disciples were preaching. After the day of Pentecost, which crossed language barriers, we know that many of those filled with the Spirit did not even speak the language of Jesus. Many of them were newcomers and likely never encountered Jesus. And we know for a fact that none of them had a Bible. This owner's manual would not be written for decades or consolidated for centuries. Of course, from our vantage point, now having a Bible, we get a glimpse of some of what these early Christians might have been gleaning by word of mouth and ultimately preaching. It was a message of the availability of God equally to all. The church would, decades later, begin to shape this good news as being grounded in the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, although many of us as Episcopalians struggle with the sacrificial language we find in Scripture, such language was revolutionary in the first century because religious practices involved sacrificing animals in the temple to cleanse oneself before God. The practice of animal sacrifice not only meant spilling blood in God's name, but all meant you had to be able to afford the loss of your animals. And to this burden was added traveling to the temple. And so you can see that the message that Jesus was, it was the sacrifice and the full and final sacrifice to God for all people, that this message was liberating, removing economic and geographic barriers to full communion with God, as well as taking violence, the violence of bloodletting out of the equation. This was a political nightmare for those in power. The message that God was present to all people without going through a system controlled by the powerful was revolutionary and disrupted that system. While being a political threat to those in power, this was a liberating message for the people of every nation. It was good news. That phrase, good news, is found in the Hebrew scriptures and it is always attached with a message of liberation, healing, and overcoming oppression and division within the community. Isaiah 61 would be an example. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has set, sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to prisoners. Secondly, I wanted to point out that whatever the message was that the early disciples were spreading, it was labeled good news. This has always astounded me. The word gospel means good news, and I've always been both delighted and kind of surprised that both those sharing the message and those receiving that message would sum it up by calling it good news. That is to say, 
If you grab someone on the street in the first century and ask them how they felt about what those disciples were preaching, their response would have been, it's good news. I'm curious. If you asked your unchurched, or sometimes more accurately, de-churched friends and neighbors how they have experienced the messages emanating from churches, would they say, ah, oh, it's good news. You see my point. How did the church lose the good news, or in some cases, not notice that the message was turning into bad news? How were churches seduced into becoming clubs, spiritual boutiques, or sophisticated gangs that believe the same things, do the same things, and quite frankly, never get out? I believe it's because the message became disconnected from the method. The message is distorted and becomes syrupy and convoluted without the method. A method that was initiated at Pentecost. So now let's talk about method. We all know that actions speak louder than words. This truism helps us understand not just what the good news was, was, but how it was felt by those receiving it. The method in the message involved people who were different, radically different, coming together and being open to learning to speak another's language. Remember that amazing account of Pentecost we read last week? And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and preparing their, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. They were filled with new wine. They became drunk, intoxicated, and elated by experiencing the message and the method coming together. It's one thing to have a message of unity and understanding and universal love and acceptance. It's another to be experiencing it in real time as peoples from every kind of background and experience come together as one and both see and feel each other as fellow human beings. In order for the church and its message to be felt as good news to the world, it has to learn the language of those who feel excluded, oppressed, left behind. So I ask you, as a predominantly white congregation, are you willing to not just believe the message of this good news, but also practice the method by learning the language of Black Lives Matter? St. John's has always yearned to be more diverse, but I have become aware that I'm not spending enough time simply listening to those with different experiences of life. I want to listen and learn the language of others. Diversity begins right here. Have you noticed how good news is being not just preached, but practiced in some protests? It happens when a chief of police is willing to take a knee and vow to serve all people with equity. It happens when police accept an invitation to walk with those protesting. It happens when 
the white CEO of Amer American Airlines is discovered reading on a flight about white privilege and is noticed by an African-American attendant who initiates a conversation that starts to develop into a friendship. It ha can happen when a predominantly white Episcopal church in the hills of Oakland commits itself to learn the language of the oppressed. Good news happens when the message and the method come together. So when I ask African-American colleagues what I can do as a white man to be an ally in overcoming racism, one said this, and I quote, it would be great if you could desegregate your life by finding opportunities to interact with us, whether that is by talking to someone you meet in the grocery line, talking to a friend via email or joining a group to work for justice, any encounter with African Americans is an opportunity to start a conversation, to desegregate your life. But nearly all of the African Americans I talk to about what is going on, whether I work with them in social justice platforms or live next door to them, say this, the most powerful thing you can do is to talk amongst yourselves about racism. Read a book together about it. Educate yourselves about our story and the many issues of racism that are embedded in our communities and nation. They say that they are tired of being expected to teach us about their experience. They would like the white community to take the initiative. In short, they're asking me, asking us to learn their language. You all received information this, in this morning's email about what you can do to help us address systemic racism in our region as we help transit operators who are nearly universally people of color get the proper protective equipment they need to be safe as they serve us as essential workers. Something being denied them right now, but we can do more. Would you join me in opening our hearts to learn another language and be part of this great commission as we begin a conversation to deepen our understanding of race in the coming weeks. If we are open, I believe we will discover that we are not only yearning for some good news, but we are also becoming a part of the good news. Lest I not say anything about the Trinity on Trinity Sunday, let me say this about Jesus. I invite you to see the incarnation as Jesus taking me with him. Was not Jesus coming to speak our language right where we live? But was he also not modeling for us the great news that we are not separated from God? No one is. So the, for the meditation today, I'm going to take a knee and I'm going to ask God to open my heart to learning the language of others. You are certainly invited to join me in such a prayer.